Good morning and welcome to our first legislative breakfast of the season. Uh, on Mondays throughout the legislative season, the Bridgeport Grange and Addison County Farm Bureau sponsor these breakfasts. And uh, we are, first of all, hopeful that you're enjoying what you have to eat this morning. Thanks to Jim and the ladies in the back here. We have a delightful breakfast. If you haven't uh, partaken in it yet, please step forward and do that. The uh, purpose of our program each week is to get legislative updates on what's going on in Montpelier to keep us well informed and to ask questions, make comments, uh, and so on throughout the uh, breakfast time. Guests uh, here will have up to two minutes to ask their question or make their statement. The questions can be directed to one or all of the legislators that are present and the legislators will have up to three minutes. They get special treatment. They get up to three minutes to respond to each question. And this year we have the addition of a, a stoplight in front. So uh, Jim's going to be operating the stoplight uh, to give you kind of a signal of when your time is up. Does it come with a siren? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it so the moderator uh, uh, is me, and for the interest of transparency and uh, all of that, my name is Tim Buskey. I live in Addison, member of the Addison County Farm Bureau, uh, vice president of Vermont Farm Bureau, retired lobbyist in agriculture, and vice president of the Addison County Home Health and Hospice. And we have a small business in Virginia, and I work full time there when I'm not here at the legislative breakfast. So uh, that just gives you an idea of where my background is. I won't be asking questions if I'm moderating, uh, but I will encourage you all to ask important questions. So what we do usually first is to introduce each of the two senators and our representatives that are here, give them an opportunity to say hello and what committees they're serving on in this second year of the biennium and uh, maybe even give them a give them chance for one word of what they're doing in their committees. So, Senator Bray and Senator Ayer, would you like to stop, start us off? Good morning, my name is Claire Ayer. I live in Addison and I'm starting my 16th year in the Senate. I chair Senate Health and Welfare in the morning and in the afternoon I sit on uh, government operations. Is that all you wanted? Uh, good morning. My name is Chris Bray. I live in New Haven, and I'm uh, starting my sixth year in the Senate. I was four years in the House before that. Uh, my morning committee, which I chair, is Senate Natural Resources and Energy, and in the afternoon, I serve on the Education Committee. Good morning. I'm Harvey Smith. I live in New Haven. I represent the towns of New Haven, Weybridge, and Bridgeport. And I serve on the House uh, Agriculture Committee. And on the House side, we only serve on one committee, so that's it. Terry Norris, I'm from Shore. I represent Benson, Orwell, Shore, and Whitey. I serve on the Ag and Forestry Committee in the House. Our production force. That's a big part. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Sharp. I serve uh, from Bristol, Lincoln, Starksboro, Moncton. Represent those communities uh, on, and chair the Education Committee. It's my 16th year in the legislature. And I'm Fred Baser. I'm also Dave Seaton, up in Bristol, northeast part of the county, and I am on the Ways and Means Committee. Good morning. Hi, I'm Diane Lamper, representative from Addison 3, and I have been serving the communities of Ferrisburg, Virginia, and Waltham, and Addison. So this is my 10th legislative session. I serve on the House Appropriations uh, Committee. Well, thank you, legislators, for introducing yourselves. 
I'm reminded that when you see the yellow light up here on the traffic light, that means you have about 30 seconds left so you can have time to wrap up what it is you're saying. So, let's get started. There are many issues that have been uh, already discussed in the legislature and many issues that are under discussion at the present time. Would anyone like to ask the first question? If not, I'll ask the first question to get you started. Tell us about what's going on with the minimum wage. We understand that you're considering a $15 minimum wage and that you're considering uh, some way to get that $15 minimum wage in place without hurting those who are who have uh, child care or uh, other kinds of subsidies. Don't all jump up. Don't jump up at once. Brett? I don't know, maybe none of us are anxious to get up and talk about it because it is in Senate in the uh, Economic Development Committee and I, I don't know that I've heard reports about what's evolving there other than uh, there is a, a fair amount of momentum for the $15 minimum wage. Um, uh, there was a study group that issued a report and uh, uh, I think something will evolve. I'm not exactly sure what the details will be. And that's about as much as I know. But I know the Senate is dealing with it. I was waiting for Fred to explain it. It's, um, it is in the Senate. Uh, it hasn't come on the floor yet, but I can tell you that the majority of the Senate, the Democrats, are committed to seeing it happen. Um, one of the things that's important to, a point that's important to make is, if, is that it would be a gradual increase and that the notion of making sure we hold people harmless, people who have child care benefits and that sort of thing has been, uh, is what has been what takes most of the time. Thank you, I think they've, um, thank you Senator, that's exactly where it's at and I'll just add that um, as chair of the Vermont Child Poverty Council that had met over the summer, this is something that we heard and we're, we were paying attention to um, and, and her testimony because of concern in the study group had taken a look at I like the gradualness of this for, from whether or not the impacts on businesses but there's also the overarching concern about um, the impacts to people's benefits uh, and, and what that might cause uh, when you think you're going to help but in the end you might be causing more, more damage so it's really important to take a look at the benefit cliffs as well as the increases in wages. Feel free to step up to the microphone and ask questions, if you have This is not on the minimum wage, is that okay? Okay. Um, I'm really excited that um, Senator Ayer is working on trying to get the cost of prescription drugs down, and I want to know more about what's happening. Thank you. Thank you for asking. We had a handful of bills, and uh, one we found out was illegal, one we found out is already being done that would be asking Medicaid to work with other states. It turns out our state works with 20 other states to get the best prices, so we don't need that bill. Uh, the one with the most impact is um, we, we are proposing that the state of Vermont become a wholesaler and import drugs from Canada. We uh, know that drugs from Canada are safe. In fact, a lot of the drugs that we could buy for a third of the price or half of the price in Canada were made in the United States and imported to Canada. So, that, so that's not an issue. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, had a few lines in it that said states could ask the feds permission to do this. So our bill does three things. First, we took testimony to make sure drugs are safe and all that sort of thing. It asks the administration to um, set up a program see what it would look like. We have to find a willing wholesaler and on this side and a willing wholesaler in Canada. Then to ask for a permit by July next year, from permission from the federal government, and then to implement it. And we ask the Green Mountain Care Board to keep track of insurance savings, hospital savings, to just sort of see what kind of a difference it made. 
And I have to remind you that um, Big Pharma has a huge litigation budget, and, and most, of, most times it's bigger than their resource and development budget, and they spend it mostly on discouraging competition or any kind of encroachment on their earnings. So I expect we'll see them in court, um, but we're gonna try. The other thing that's sort of interesting, it's recycling unused drugs, uh, especially in nursing homes, and uh, well, you probably get this long-term uh, residential care settings, people with chronic illnesses, um, when they get better or very often when they die, they have a, a boatload, a laundry basket full of medicines that are already in the, in the um, bubble packs. They're already, you know, they have the numbers on them and so on. A number of states have done this. It doesn't uh, really save the state money, but hospitals, nursing homes, and those kinds of places pay by the ton to recycle the drugs or to incinerate the drugs. So that those drugs, which are perfectly useful, go up in the air. People pay for that. This would uh, pay for the in infrastructure. It'll probably happen through the Department of Health to check out those drugs. We wouldn't take drugs that expire, drugs that require refrigeration. We wouldn't have any drugs that are narcotics and that sort of thing and sell them to people of low income, above Medicaid, but low income people to help them with their expenses. More questions? Yes. The question is what the number, the bill number. number. You can look them up under the suggestion is that since we're on television, it's really good to, to talk into the microphones and identify yourself when you're when you're speaking too. But the question was, what bill number was that? The answer was, Claire didn't know right now, but you can look it up on the internet by topic. Okay, so more questions. Does anybody want to okay, go ahead? Good morning, my name is Bob Nixon from Middlebury. Um, I'm just curious as to why there was such a, a rush to pass the marijuana bill in light of the fact that all the research is not in and so forth. And right here in the town of Quickport, uh, they had four people killed and after the accident was investigated, they found out that marijuana was involved. And I, I just don't understand the rationale behind passing that law when you've taken, you've taken the uh, drug dealers, we'll call them, away from the people that were buying it, and they say, well, this is gonna eliminate the drug dealers. Well, what, you got, what you've done is you've said, we've gotta focus now on a new uh, demographic of population to sell our marijuana. And the demographics, they're gonna go after the people under 21 who cannot grow or by marijuana. So I, I just don't understand when all the, the, the studies are not in yet why this was passed in such a rush. So if someone could answer that and so that I can understand that, maybe I'm just not seeing the whole light here, but uh, I, I don't understand this at all. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I wasn't dramatically involved in the marijuana bill, but you may recall that the Senate passed a bill about two years ago. This has been, this bill has been in existence for at least the 16 years that I've been in the Senate. It's not a rush. It makes a little forward momentum, maybe getting taken up in a committee and then nothing happens and the next year it might have more discussion. So it's, it's not been sudden and it's not been a rush. Um, the second thing is uh, I, I did support a bill that was a tax and regulate bill. I wanted to have uh, resources to make sure we, we uh, spent a lot of time educating young people. That is the one thing I worried about was uh, brain, the actually brain damage from in uh, adolescent and young adult brains. Uh, and, and young kids didn't, don't, don't believe that. They think it's probably safe. But having said that, it's, it's all around us. The problems are already there. Um, I, all I can say is we didn't rush the, the um, data, the, the research about it can't be done because it was illegal. The feds did not allow us to research it because we weren't allowed to possess it. It's a very logical thing, but you'll find um, 
it, 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 no matter what source you look at, you can find another source that says it's not really quite that way. Um, I'll add a, a couple notes. So, uh, you know, I, I suppose if there was uh, no marijuana on planet Earth, you might say, well, let's not bring yet another drug to a society that's struggling with drug problems. But it turns out that there are uh, estimates, credible estimates, of roughly 80 to 100,000 Vermonters are regular pot users. So when you have somewhere around one-sixth of the population engaging in what's currently defined as an illegal activity, uh, it's just not a healthy paradigm to make that many people lawbreakers. And we need something to acknowledge that uh, this is a choice that many, many people make. And let's try to improve that uh, on that reality. So uh, the bill we passed also has a whole provision to develop uh, through a group the tax and regulate kind of uh, program that Senator Harris spoke about. And for me as a legislator, I always think our first duty is the public health and safety. I was disappointed that the bill that was brought forward no longer included the kind of robust funding and public health and safety program that a full-fledged program uh, would entail, but I think we will get there, and we had it, I think we're doing it. It's not unusual for legislatures to do things in multiple steps, and I think uh, 511 moves us in the right direction. I figured I'd, I would get up because I'm somebody that could actually speak to the fact that I, I was not in favor of this yet. I, you know, I, I come from a history of, of working at ADAP, which is the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs, worked on the Adolescent <clears throat> Treatment Grant, and so for me personally, and having seen it, it was really, really a tough, tough thing. Now, the, the citizens, the majority of which, you know, I'm listening to my constituents, really, really are looking forward to making something that, that's very prevalent legal. And this last election was very telling. Massachusetts is moving in that direction. Maine has moved in this direction. Canada is moving in this direction. Vermont needs to um, deal with something that's as a reality for a lot of people and needs to do it in a thoughtful way. I would say that it was not rushed. I would agree with the senators that it's been a part of the conversation for many, 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 many years. And as far as like if somebody wanted to say it was rushed this year, it was because it was left on the calendar. It was unfinished business uh, because of some technicalities uh, in the last session that it was not able to be brought up. And it was just merely on the calendars, the next item to be voted on for this year. So no hurry. It was just actually, why did it have to hang over until this session? John Ball from Madison. Uh, I'm concerned about drug use too, but the main drug I'm, or one of the main drugs I'm concerned about in our culture is the opioids. The Oxycontin type of things that were manufactured and put out by the Sackler family who would make billions of dollars every year with these drugs. They are pushed by their sales uh, uh, people. Doctors are told how wonderful they are. Kids are hooked on them at a very young age. They're extremely addictive. It goes on and on and on. Here is, it's not the only one, but here is where one of the major drug problems in our culture exists. There, there are, uh, I think, 700,000 deaths last year from overdose of Oxycontin or opioid type, type drugs. Uh, I think if we want to get serious about drugs, these are the areas we need to be looking at and not a recreational, relatively harmless drug uh, such as marijuana that people, adults, using it in the privacy of their own home is pretty much their business. It's not killing people uh, like these other things are. So let's look at the opioids and uh, put the stress on that, please. Thank you. Good morning. I guess most of you know how I feel about it. I've been fighting it for the last four or five years. And I thought this year, you know, that boy, you pushed it through pretty fast there. But I think, you know, in my mind, the biggest part is money. 
eight wants that money. And I think they're more concerned about that than they are the youth of our state. And I asked here a year, maybe two years ago, how many more state troopers are we going to have to have? How many more rehab centers are we going to have? And I haven't heard an answer to that yet. And you know, I can see a young boy or girl, he wouldn't break the law for anything in the world. But they go out with their friends some night, and their friends are going to buy a little weed. And they get thinking, well, it's legal now. Maybe I'll try it. And that's the beginning. And believe it or not, I got through, I'm 88, never done drugs, never smoked, and never, never drank very much. I like a beer once in a while, but I, I'm worried about what this state, what this country is coming to. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because you know in our committee we there was there were some questions right I, not even just in our committee just regular members that were looking at you know we passed the a bill that limit the ability or not the ability but limited the number of pills to be prescribed by a doctor to see if we did kind of lessen the availability out in the public around around opiates. I know that you know I've been to the dentist and had dental work done and walked out with a handful of. Of, of prescription drugs it's you know that was actually the prescription was good for six months and I thought of some little dental procedure and I still needed you know painkillers for six months or something seriously wrong with that so I was very pleased with the work and I, I think the, the senators could speak more to the fact of what happened but I, I do have a report here that from Blue Cross and Blue Shield we asked like what was what's the trend now on the number of opiates that are out there and, and, uh, and this report here, which I'd be willing to share any place, but it says between 2013 and 2016, the uh, therapy of opiates uh, that were prescribed by Blue Cross and Blue Shield members fell by 27%. So there was there's a 27% drop in the opiates that were prescribed by through Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And I think that's through some of the efforts of the limits that were put on. So um, that's that I would take as uh, a, a little bit of a light, and light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. The coffee's really strong, so I'm starting to get really hyped up. <laughs> we, pa we passed a bill that addressed physician prescription of opiates a couple of years ago. But in fact, um, doctors knew then, before then, what had happened, how they'd been fooled, and how they had gone down sort of the wrong path. We still had outliers. So to be fair, our le legal prescription of opiates had started to decrease before we passed the bill, and it has dropped pretty dramatically since then. But just like so many other problems, now we have a new, now it's different. Instead of people getting hooked on these kinds of drugs because they find a little oxy in the, in the folks' medicine cabinet or in somebody, a friend's medicine cabinet, they go right to heroin. It's dirt cheap, it's on the street, you can get it anywhere. And um, there are a lot of other drugs that are happening. So the opiate crisis as it relates to prescription, pres uh, you know, physician prescribed opiates is not over, but we've moved on to something that's just as hard to deal with. Just saying. Thank you. Uh, at the report, I, I think you may have uh, hit on something. Uh, that I was thinking about. Uh, let's uh, let's have a few let, let's have a few more prescription drugs out there rather than that uh, uh, that stuff that's uh, on the black market with a fentanyl that kill, kills them. Boom. <laughs> uh, I not I was not I was not still not of in favor of the uh, of the wacky tobacco as you might call. I I figured uh, I not trying to uh, put it on maybe the legislatures that are here, but my idea was hell we're all uh, we're all doing it. We we better make it legal so we don't get caught. Thank you. 
more word on marijuana or if we can move on to another topic. Well, Wagner lived in Bitport here, had a farm, dairy farm for 42 years. I saw the light and I stopped doing it. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> on this marijuana, I remember 40 years ago they was milking the cows and this doctor wrote a book called Keep Off the Grass and he explained all the detrimental effects of marijuana. And the reporter asked him, well, have you ever smoked marijuana? He said, oh, hell no, I see what it does, I never do that. So, what they don't talk about is the concentration of TCH in marijuana. I said, well, it's just a little weed, it's harmless. No, it's not. In 1970, the TCH level in marijuana was 1%. They tested the marijuana that the drug dealers are selling, and it's 36%. See, so it's, that's as hallucinogenic and as toxic as cocaine or heroin. So, well, a little weed, that's not a problem. No, it's not. But no one ever talks about the concentration of the dope and dope. They don't talk about it in the articles. No one says that. So no, it's not harmless. It's a hallucinogenic drug. And I even heard they advertise that crap beers in the state is hung up on crap beers. That they put TCH in the crap beer. So talk about being drugged up. That's an actual market of deer right now. So I don't think it should have approved it, especially when you can smoke marijuana in your home when you have little kids. They didn't put any you know, restrictions on that. Um, I wanted to follow up on the, uh, it, it's true and we've heard plenty of testimony, I think anyone, uh, that uh, THC content has gone up dramatically over the last 30 years. Part of the whole notion of the value of moving to a, a regulated environment is that there would be testing careful laboratory work and labeling so that people would know uh, the THC content of what they were buying and that would, I think, be helpful information to consumers. The other thing is that uh, it would, the testing would include making sure that there were no um, other substances. So for instance, there are black market growers who might be using herbicides or pesticides on that crop that are are not healthy to um, ingest, but uh, they're not going through any kind of screening for product quality, if you want to call it that. And so you might be exposed to um, things that are definitely dangerous to your health by buying in a black market. Uh, I don't think there was, I'll just say for myself, I've not heard people, for the most part, talk about marijuana as an opportunity to make uh, a lot of money for the state. I know people talk about tax and regulate, but I know my first concern, and I think many other people's concern, is that the revenues that would come out of it would be to run a well-designed uh, program, including increased public health and safety. On the public health and on the safety side, the state has trained. There is no uh, sort of alcohol breathalyzer equivalency test yet, uh, which uh, so people have been looking at other ways to detect impairment. There are people who get training, they're called drug recognition experts, and we have about 40 in the state now uh, as a result of training over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think from what I've heard from uh, state troopers, that's about the right number of people to have distributed around the state in order to be able to recognize impairment, regardless of their inability to test or the actual presence of any particular drug at that moment. Ask me the question and I'll repeat it for you. No, I want to tell a little story now. Okay. You have to move to the microphone. I, I hate to do this to you, but. I didn't know if you want me to speak. Yeah. Right. Bill Keyes again. I'd like to tell you about a little dream I had, and this had to do with drugs. This was quite a few years ago. I just got out of the hospital, and my doctor put me on OxyContin. I had some trouble sleeping, and the first night I had kind of a strange dream. Didn't think much about it. 
The next night I had an even more strange dream. But the third night, boy, I had a dream and there was a group of people down here, I was with them, and they, there's a group up here on top of the hill had stolen our car. And, well, we were going to go up and get it, one of the fellows said. You have a gun? I said, no, I don't have, even have a gun in the house. I was with it, and that's how I knew that. And, well, if you're going to go with us, you better get a gun. And there's a little lady over here standing, and kind of like a little angel. She says, follow me, you won't get in trouble. Well, I took her advice. It was my wife. But I went to the bathroom, and I come out, and boy, I stood my hands on the bed. And Audrey says, what's the trouble? I said, I don't really know. Boy, I, I was out of it there for, for probably four or five minutes. But I was wearing up, I didn't have a house. And you know, to this day, I often wonder sometimes, if I had had a gun in that house, what would I have done? And that's my last word on marijuana. <laughs> Willis, uh, live in Salisbury, um, and uh, I'll change the subject if that's okay, the topic. Um, I'm just curious, um, the governor had an interesting, um, to education, the governor had an interesting suggestion last week um, to cut uh, education costs, which would be to reduce the teacher-pupil ratio, which um, as a retired teacher, I'm finding that that would be really hard to do in small schools um, where uh, unless you wanted to have a teacher who was teaching third, fourth, and fifth grades perhaps. Um, so at any rate, I'm just curious what uh, the reaction's been in Montpelier, if the thought, what thoughts are there in terms of um, educational expenditures. And the other comment I'll have is that um, we're in the second year of Act 46. I'm on a little group in um, Salisbury, and we are struggling to hold on to our town meeting. We no longer have a school meeting. Um, in Salisbury, our town budget is voted by Australian ballot. So there's really no reason to have town meeting. Um, and we are trying to make a reason up. Um, but I'm just curious how if the legislators, legislatures is aware of this kind of unintended consequence of the consolidation process, um, or if there are other towns that are struggling with um, this issue also. So kind of a couple of topics here. So education first, I'll <laughs> uh, Good morning. Um, so, uh, the legislature decided to divide the uh, uh, concerns and uh, efforts around education into two pieces. And um, uh, Fred and the Ways and Means Committee are going to uh, give serious consideration to the education funding formula and how we pay for education. And my committee, the uh, Education Committee, is responsible for examining the ways to cut costs in education. Um, the governor did put several uh, proposals on the table, uh, including the ratios. Uh, we looked at ratios when I was on the Ways and Means Committee oh, five years ago maybe and had a study done. Uh, the, uh, it is true that um, state mandates of what ratios might be in school districts across the state is extremely problematic. And to tell a school with 20 children in it that they had to have a ratio similar to a school with 1,000 students in it is, um, is very uh, problematic for those schools. So we chose at the time not to go down the road of mandating ratios from the state. And I suspect that my committee will uh, move in that same direction this year, although we will take up the governor's um, proposal. The, um, Cutting costs in education is an interesting um, conundrum. 
uh, at the same time that we ha have a, a fairly widespread uh, uh, request or concern about the cost in education because we see the costs going up roughly the rate of inflation while the student bodies, uh, the number of students we're educating is going down. And that, that concern is, is a valid concern that we should, we should take seriously. On the other hand, we have quality high schools in the state, for example, Burr and Burton, that, um, that sets a tuition rate, and they recently raised that tuition rate to 17,500. So it turns out, if you want to have quality education, which I think Vermonters want, and it's why they vote for uh, school budgets across the state, overwhelmingly supporting school budgets proposed by school boards across the state, that we actually value quality education, and quality education actually costs money. Um, so uh, looking at how we can constrain costs within an environment where quality education costs money uh, is problematic. The one area that really is promising is around special education. When we did Act 46, one of the uh, parts of it was a, a, an adequacy study. And that was, uh, are we spending the right amount of money in K through 12 education? And PICUS, who's done these in 20 plus states across the country, said, we are spending the right amount of money. Do I get an extra minute or am I done? Thank you. I'll give him mine. <laughs> and they said, we're spending about the right amount of money in K through 12 education. We're spending 30 million too much in administration and 140 too much million too much in special education. So we did Act 46, and the, the results are promising. We do see reductions in both staff and administration, so we're seeing some administrative costs going down, and that's really promising. In addition, we're seeing the opportunities, educational opportunities for kids improving, which is really a good thing. Uh, and we're taking seriously this year the reports around special education. Uh, if we could save half of the 140 million, that would be a really good thing. And we have some evidence that we may, able, may be able to do that, and we're taking testimony. I expect we'll have a bill out before the end of February, and you'll see the details around how we can do a better job around special education and save money for taxpayers at the same time. The last thing I would say is that um, the education costs a lot of money. What's really bothering Vermonters is not so much how much we're spending on education, but how much their property tax is. And it's my hope that we move more towards an income tax to support K-12 through education before we get done. So Dave, before you leave, uh, a quick question that I think people have you had a report on Act 46 this year? Has there been a legislative report with some statistics and figures? Or, uh, I didn't know if there was a study or something that we could look to. There is a report on Act 46. Um, I'm not sure how helpful it is, um, but it, it's on our website. Um, we, we, in the districts that have moved to Act 46, uh, they have reduced staff and they have uh, demonstrated more opportunities for children. So um, I'll try to get that information out. Great. On Ways and Means, we've spent uh, most of the month of January examining how we pay for public education. And I think I can report to you that it's quite likely for the first time in 20 years, roughly, that we're likely to see a change in the way we pay for public education. Um, the current system is fairly complicated and most legislators can't explain how we pay for education and, and I kind of get confused sometimes. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the issues we want to try to correct. Um, we're a long way from, from uh, sending something out of committee, but I think what you're going to see is a system where the uh, where we're going to rely on that, it's going to be like a three-legged stool. We're going to sweep all the sales and the purchase and use taxes, uh, some of which education gets today, but we're going, to, we're going to sequester all of it. We're also going to charge you all more income tax. So your income tax rates are going to go up. 
Um, a lot of people pay for public education today based on income as it is because of the income sensitivity. But a lot of it comes as a deduction to your property tax. It's confusing. There are other factors that get involved in that. We're going to do away with that. You're going to pay an income tax. How much um, uh, and, and, and at what levels we haven't yet determined, but we're moving in that direction. The third thing we're going to do is we're going to lower people's property taxes. And our goal is to lower them by about 40%. The models we've seen so far uh, that have been developed are such that if you pay $900 more in income tax, the hope is your property taxes will have gone down by something like $900. It's not going to be perfectly fair for everyone, but we feel that the system will be more transparent. We're going to go from a state that perhaps depends on the property tax more than almost any other state in the nation for funding education to a state where we have more diversification when it comes to how we raise the dollars. And uh, uh, we're kind of excited about this prospect. The last thing that uh, I think you'll see is that today I think some folks have lost the sense that uh, what they vote for on town meeting day for public education uh, is something that they can see directly the impact of um, on their property tax bill, I guess, or, or just feel the impact directly of today. What we're working on is a system where uh, when you go and vote for your education fund at town meeting day, there will be a direct implication, something that you can identify with that will occur on your property tax. Um, so we want to tie people's votes directly into what the outcomes would be. Good outcomes for lower costs or higher costs because the budgets are being raised. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, the details will come and I'm sure at another one of these breakfasts in the future I can, I can speak more uh, about the specifics. But that's, that's the general gist of it. Anybody want to speak on the same subject, yeah. or should we change? Yeah. You're on the same subject. Okay. On the same subject. Yes. <coughs> well, Heidi, there's what I did, and there's probably looking around at the gray hairs. There's probably uh, many of us that went to a one-room school in all eight grades. And I can speak for myself that I was able to continue my education, went to UVM, I was even on the honors for a while. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, you know, one teacher, and, well, and I think we had about, well, probably, 15, 18 in our little one-room school. Uh, so it can be done. It's more complicated now. I, uh, I see that the, there was a report just last night on the news that we're, as a nation, we're way behind on what they call STEM, science and math. Uh, uh, we're more we're more worried about <coughs> other other things that may not be quite so important. But uh, we, I'm glad to hear that we're working on uh, the reduction. Uh, the Keith Hall, uh, he's passed, but he was a former superintendent up in. Bristol, I can't tell you what district, but he was, uh, <clears throat> he said, all we need is one superintendent for the, for the whole county. And uh, we need to get, <clears throat> we need to get rid of princ uh, $80,000 principals for uh, a school of 80, uh, that's $1,000 
thousand dollars a kid. We can, we can, we've got a lot of savings there uh, without compromising our education. Thank you. I want to follow up. Uh, so with Senate Education, <coughs> excuse me, Senate Education last week, we had uh, uh, Secretary uh, Young in to talk about the governor's memo that came over to the legislature about 10 days ago. And in that memo, it was a list of 18 ideas. Uh, we were carefully told that they were ideas, uh, not proposals, and that the governor wasn't actually arguing for any of these, but he would like us to think about them. And if we wanted to develop legislation, uh, he would look at anything that came, uh, that came out of the legislature. Uh, one of those that I think I uh, wanted to come back to is staffing ratios. And I think uh, the governor in his budget address said Vermont has roughly four adults in the building working for every one student. Uh, if we went to five to one, we would still have uh, one of the most whatever supportive ratios in the country. Uh, so one of the things we're looking into is uh, breaking down those numbers because those aren't uh, five teachers, those aren't, uh, that's not a one teacher for five children. There are many other staffers in the building. So we deliver a lot of uh, services at schools. They're not necessarily education per se, but in terms of public health and uh, counseling, uh, special education assistance that's uh, not necessarily education oriented. Uh, we end up with a lot of other people in the building delivering those services. So we've been talking about separating out education proper from social services and public health services delivered at schools just to give us a clearer picture of the kind of ratios Vermont really has relative to other states. So Senator Briggs said most of what I was going to say, but I, I would add that um, Schools over the last uh, several years, I don't remember the exact details, but let's say the last five years or so, have reduced the number of staff, teaching staff, in their buildings. In most cases, they've had to replace those teaching staff with behavior specialists, mental health workers, social workers, because students are coming to our schools with many more unmet uh, social needs than they have in the past. Uh, we see a breakdown of these problems in our community. We talked about drugs a little bit earlier here today. Um, and uh, because our mental health systems are not robust enough in our communities to deal with these problems, schools have ended up dealing with these issues as the students arrive in school. And the school is dedicated, uh, as educators in this room know, schools are dedicated to the sex success of those students. And if that means addressing their mental and social needs, then so be it. And schools have taken on that task. So in many cases, while teaching staff has been able to be reduced over the last number of years, schools have had to increase uh, social workers and mental health workers. Diane. I'll just add also because I, I served on the, the Poverty Council with, with Dave and others and some of the things that we've supported in the past that I, the, the legislature is now really moving on. There's a couple of bills around ACEs. You've heard of this before. The adverse childhood experiences that the children in our state are experiencing at toxic stress levels in their life and it's really impacting their ability to be able to come to school ready to learn and to move on and some of you know some of the pockets around this which we were talking earlier about the opiate crisis the impact that that's having on our kids you know um the the addiction of of parents and and others and the and the reinforcing nurturing world of a child is is under all of these stressors that the child's ability to deal with is impacted in a way so you add on top of that Poverty in in our in our state and um, and and other issues, um, legal issues. When you when we hear in committee from the judiciary committee, you know uh, the court system is is asking for more money because they're seeing a 64 percent increase in the cases 
in the court system around chins and the, uh, and the child um, uh, neglect cases. Um, this, is, this is happening in our, in our world and it's not without impact on the education committee or community. Um, something that was brought to my mind to actually kind of create some space around this and I've been an advocate for coming from the, from the council is for you know, a lot of the great work that's happening at after school there's the child care situation, which is, which is in itself difficult, uh, education world and after school. There's the three spaces. There's a child's first space is with their parents, their second space within the community of education, and that third space is all that other time in their world. And um, what do we offer for them to be able to explore um, themselves and to ready themselves for the world within that world as well? Thank you. Step right up. I like this based on the education. The problem in this state is you have too many teachers, too many schools, and too many teachers in. I mean, Cabot, I just read that in the paper, the high school has less than, half the classes are less than seven kids. I mean, it costs the same whether you've got 30 kids in a class or you've got five kids in a class. The fixed cost is the same. So you take like Cornwall School has 60 something kids, they're within five miles of Mary Hogan. Well, Mary Hogan has room for 250 kids. So you could shut that school down. And Waybridge, they're within five miles. You could shut that school down. They, their cost per student is $24,000 a year. So you could consolidate these schools, and then you can have more options when you have a big school. You can have a full-time music teacher and all that. It's just too costly. But only in Chittenden County, which runs the legislature up there, they have a different situation than all the other 13 counties in the state. So they, when you rule the legislature, you have to think about the other 13. But you've got too many schools, so you have to consolidate them. But you talk to the people in town, oh no, you can't close my school, you close your school. And this is the backlash you get. But sooner or later, when you don't want to shift it to income tax to pay for the schools, because half, 150,000 taxpayers in this state Half of them pay no tax at all. If so you file income tax and you get all your money back, tax return, you're not a taxpayer in the state, personal income tax. So that'll leave 75,000 taxpayers. Out of those 75,000 taxpayers pay $640 million in personal income tax. 8,000 pay $148 million. That's an average of $19,000 state tax for 8,000 taxpayers. So that's the ones you're going to go after if you're going to shift it to income tax. So if tax gets too high, they say, bye. We don't have to stay here. We leave. See, 60 percent of income in this state is not earned in this state. That's retirement income. Uh, that's a uh, trust fund baby income. So they don't have to stay here. But if you make it so high in taxes, they're going to leave. And when they leave, they take their money with them. You have to understand that. So you all have to close the schools and cut this cost per student down by consolidating the schools. What's being contemplated on the income tax side is a very separate and distinct tax that everyone will pay. Uh, that perhaps at the very lowest end we won't have people pay. but. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that people will be able to through various deductions or income levels of oil. So uh, it's, it's everyone contributes to the system, at least in theory. Uh, and we are sensitive to the fact that uh, we, you, know, you want a fair tax system, and if people late make a significant amount more money than others, as we have it today in most things, they pay more. But we certainly don't want to put a burden on them so that they might make decisions uh, that would be uh, contrary to the best interests of Vermont. Uh, so we're sensitive to that. We've also kind of learned that uh, there are many reasons why people might leave Vermont. Um, income taxes isn't high on the list, believe it or not. Um, it, it, it may be a factor. Estate taxes sometimes is a bigger thing, but not so much, not so much the income tax thing. So we're going to work on trying to make it fair 
and it's going to be a, a separate line item on your taxes, I'm pretty sure, so that everyone will contribute. Or they'll get a little bit less back, something like that. But, but, but it's going to be uh, as fair as we can make it. So with regard to closing schools, um, if you think Act 46 was difficult, the outrage uh, across the state about the notion of the state closing schools uh, would, would be uh, enormous. And uh, everybody would fear that it was their school that would be closed and the town next door, is, uh, as you point out, the town next door is the one that would keep their school and my school would be closed and that's unfair. Um, my perspective uh, uh, as an educator, as a, as a legislator, as a parent, um, is that our small community schools uh, elementary schools, K through six. Um, you can have multiple grades, and many schools across the state do have multiple grades in small elementary schools. And those are the heart of many of our communities. So I don't think it's the role of Montpelier to tell communities that they've got to close their small elementary schools. Um, that's part of the Act 46 process, and uh, in cases where it is appropriate for uh, elementary schools to close, I suppose that needs to happen. But I believe that our small elementary schools are good and that we should, in, the, in large part, keep those elementary schools. My concern comes with high schools. We have a high school um, in the state that I believe is slated to be closed due to uh, a vote around Act 46. Had 10 students in the graduating class. Two of them participated in early college, and two of them went to the local tech center. So there were six in the class. Now you tell me how you can do a chem lab or a physics lab, how you can have an advanced calculus program in a high school that is constrained with six students in a graduating class. How can you have a basketball team or a football team? How can you create the kind of opportunities that high school kids need and, and it, as we look at uh, the skills that we have to develop for our students moving into the workforce, how you can do that in a school that has six kids in the graduating class. So I believe there ought to be some closure of high schools around the state. We have thus far left this up to the Act 46 process, and because of it, uh, several high schools in the state will close. Um, and we'll have to see how this plays out, whether the state gets involved in forcing the closure of high schools. I don't like the notion of the state dictating to communities how they're going to do their education. Um, but I suppose if, it, if the situation um, deteriorates in some schools across the state, there will be a call for Montpelier to get involved. But that's just my perspective on the closing of schools. really concerned about this gentleman over against the wall who's been waiting and waiting and waiting. But I, um, so I'll just make this short. Um, Heidi Willis again from Salisbury. This is, uh, I have been a passionate advocate for community schools um, all the time that I've been in Vermont because I believe they are the heartblood of the community. Um, but I also have come to the realization, I think, this is going to be my suggestion that it's going to happen probably it could happen five or ten years down the road. I think we're going to get to the point where we need to, as we throw up old roads in towns, we will be throwing up communities. And we will say that there are going to be schools in these communities, and they'll be, uh, you know, of a, of a region, reasonable size. You won't be busing kids for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening in order to get to some distant school. And then there will, be, and and the costs will be affordable, and then in other communities there won't be schools, and um, uh, and that will be that will be what we'll be working on. As a as a person concerned with environmental issues, um, I would not support growing our population in order to solve this problem. I think we probably reached the carrying capacity of the state, so we need to figure out. A sustainable way to educate our kids and live on the landscape at the same time. Your turn. Thanks. Okay. 
Okay, my name is Tom Vanapar. I live in Bridport, Vermont, and um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, water quality issue as it relates to farms. So this would be, uh, for the legislators, this would be the required agricultural practices and funding. I'm understanding that right now it's about a $20 million per year question that goes on for perhaps a generation. And based on what I'm hearing from the agencies and also from uh, the governor, there appears to be a movement to, for lack of a better word, commoditize the pollutants. In other words, put a dollar figure on phosphorus um, in such a way that it goes from being a pollutant to somehow being a commodity that is then being sold. In practice, I think what we're doing by doing that is perpetuating the problem. We're basically building into the solution the fact that that problem can never go away because people are making money off it and they've built a the whole infrastructure around making money by concentrating phosphorus. In this case it would be within the anaerobic digesters, uh, methane producers, which will be tied into Green Mountain Power. So you see there's like this massive uh, administrative and regulatory framework that's being built up that in my opinion is essentially extending the problem rather than solving the problem. <coughs> now I have an axe to grind because I run an agricultural minerals business and uh, I, I work nationwide so I see what farms are doing all over the country. And I can tell you that large farms, very large farms, 6,000, 12,000 acre farms, are moving to sustainable uh, practices that take into account nutrient management. We found a mineral in the, in the valley here that is a superb uh, capture, selective sorbent for uh, solution phosphorus. And we found it a number of years ago and we've been working on the science for several years. <clears throat> this year I asked the Agency of Natural Resources, uh, DEC, and AG if there was any money to help with R&D uh, or to commercialize this material. And I was told essentially flatly no. There is no money for R&D and no money for commercializing uh, what amounts to a local resource which is shown to be very cost effective. And I know they've only captured 3,500 pounds of phosphorus in 2016 by their own estimation, and yet it's cost $20 million. So that would be $5,740 a pound for phosphorus. Now that's ridiculous. That would mean that a ton of our material, which can capture 20 pounds of solution phosphorus, is worth $100,000 sitting right here in Champlain Valley. It's $100,000 per ton to the state for that purpose and they're telling me that there's no money for a local resource and yet they want to commoditize the pollutant. So my question is, is where's the help for local businesses who have been working on this for years, who have experience? Why are we being shut out of the process and how are the wraps going to reflect, the required agricultural practices going to ref reflect the best dollar return for the state for the best outcomes? How is that going to be written into law if we, if we decide we're going to spend 20 million a year? That's my question. All right. Yes, uh, thank you, Tom. I need to talk to you a little more. A little more information from you on, on this, but uh, I will say that uh, the agriculture community, at least in Addison County, the Champlain Basin, has taken a real lead on uh, innovative uh, practices to help uh, reduce phosphorus, and we're looking for any help that we can get to uh, increase that as well. But I would say that. Um, the agriculture community has taken this on as a mission to do their part to clean up uh, the, the waters of the state. And I know Brian Kemp is here, and I'm hoping that he'll be interested in speaking to this. 
Uh, he's chair of the Lake Champlain Farmers Coalition. Not anymore? Champlain Valley. Champlain Valley. So anyways, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with some of the innovative uh, activities. The farms have really um, invested their own funds in and their own time in. And I know when we talk about the cover crops as a way to reduce uh, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus is attached to soil particles, so when the soil runs off, so doesn't the phosphorus. And coming up with a way to keep that uh, soil particles uh, and the phosphorus in place is very important. But the interesting part is we have the equipment uh, that was never really designed for the several heavy soils that we've had here in Addison County. And our farmers right here in Addison County have taken the leadership role and the financial responsibility to modify that equipment that actually works to that extent. And as you look around, you'll see a lot more cover crops now uh, than we ever did. And I don't know, uh, Brian, you want to add to that? Sure, thanks, Harvey. Again, Brian Kent, I'm president of the Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition. And I came today, you know, to also um, reiterate what Harvey said. Farmers here are doing a lot. We are changing. We are improvising. We're adjusting our practices uh, to help improve water qualities across the state. And it's not just here in this county. It's, it's farmers all over the state. And this is a, a big financial burden when we start uh, changing our and adopting our equipment to go into no-till practices and whatnot. Um, the, the soils here, particularly in this county, are very challenging, as many of the older farmers in the room know. You know, uh, moldboard plowing was a common fall practice in Vermont. And with the adoption of cover crops and no-till now, you're seeing very a lot less acreage in, a, in Addison County, torn up in the fall and left plowed or chisel plowed. You know, you're seeing the cover crops, you're seeing the green fields, uh, particularly now the snow covers left, you can see the fields that have it. And that's keeping the soil in place and it's, it's keeping less of the soil runoff going into the lake carrying the phosphorus. Um, and it, it comes at a cost and um, Tom, I'm well aware of your product, you know, we've talked about it and uh, you ask where the money's going and, and uh, you know the farmers are using a lot of that money and um, from the Clean Water Act or money that was given from USDA a few years ago. Um, it's unfortunate that some of the businesses can't utilize that also. I, I hear you. And, uh, but the farmers are utilizing the money, the taxpayers' dollars. We're trying to change and, and improve. Uh, the other thing I wanted to come and say is the senator sitting here. Uh, that I'd like them to hear is, uh, you know, a lot of the bills this year that are on the table, the ones, uh, you know, relating to water quality and tile drainage. Uh, we need to base this tile drainage on local facts, and minor institutes in the middle of a study. We need to wait and see what these results are from this area with these soils. We aren't, we shouldn't be basing legislative rules on Midwest data, Canadian data. Soils are different, topography is different, climate's different, practices around the tile drainage are different. And our group and other groups across the state uh, have had input this year into this uh, for the report that the Ag Agency had to put into the legislators. Uh, so we just urge you to let the data come in and base future rules and regulations on local data and not data from elsewhere. Uh, as far as the organic transition, I know I'm running out of time, but <laughs> um, I don't think that's the answer. I am an organic farmer. I'm a beef farmer. I, I'm not a dairy farmer. But that conversion from traditional conventional dairy, which we all know is in a crisis, is only going to make an organic crisis. There's not the market there. These organic buyers right now are already putting organic dairy farms on quotas. And if they go over their quota, they're only going to get a conventional price. If we take thousands of farms in Vermont and make them all transition organic, that market's gone. It's destroyed. There's not the market there. Somebody needs, they say we can build it. Well, somebody better start building it. 
Without the dairy farms in this state and the infrastructure, the fuel dealers, the feed dealers, the fertilizer dealers, well, they'll be gone for organic. But we still need all that infrastructure and it impacts much more than just the farm. It impacts the whole state if these farms are gone. I can see, I can see all the legislators quickly heading. Um, I apologize. I have to go to a hearing in Middlebury, so I'll jump up ahead of Danny and uh, thank for letting me get involved. So a couple things, a uh, few things. Organic, uh, that organic, non-organic, this has been a question for years. I don't think the state defines markets for people, and I think that we'll let the markets sort that out. Farmers have made their own choices about which one they want to be part of, and uh, at least in the Senate Natural Resources and Energy, we're not designing a market that's uh, to tell people they ought to organic. People will make their own best choices. Uh, on tile drains, the, uh, in 2015 we passed a law that said we needed a tile drain rule by January 1 of this year. Um, and actually the Agency of Agriculture just put in a, a proposed rule. There are, as you point out, studies going on. Of course we want things tailored to our climate, our soils, our practices. And so I, my understanding is the rule now is uh, relatively sort of modest in scope. As we learn more, the rule may be worked on further by Agency of Agriculture and brought back to the legislature. So it's a work in progress. Um, overall, I, I know um, the direction I think that we're going that's most promising in my uh, mind on agriculture is that rather than when we talk about water quality problems, we're talking about a problem that's been created and then mostly in the form of nutrients uh, leaving a farm or a parking lot, you name it, um, roads. And, but coming, since we're talking agriculture, I'll come back to ag. <clears throat> we have in the RAPs a healthy soils provision. And by that we mean uh, soils with more organic matter and the, the reason they're in there is because those soils tend to be uh, from everything I've learned so far, I'm happy to learn more in case you look at it differently, uh, that they tend to be more physically stable in heavy rain events and more chemically stable, less likely to have a nutrient sleeve. So a, uh, I'd say the healthy soils provision is bringing a healthy ecology to the uh, to soils as an issue. And I think that in the end, my take, if you ask me 10 years ahead is, Healthy soils will be the, the root or the foundation of a cleaner water system in the state of Vermont uh, across the board. And we'll be focusing uh, less on mitigating damage and more about avoiding it from the outset. We could talk about uh, water quality um, and agriculture all day, I'm sure. And so uh, I look forward to future legislative breakfasts when we come back. To it. Yes, we hope you can come next week if you can. <laughs> the last word. The last word. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just three things. So the first thing on around the uh, agriculture piece in uh, the budget area and house appropriations, the agriculture budget is one that I'm in charge of and to make recommendations on. And I work with uh, the ag committee and their representative. They were in the uh, um, secretary was in this week to present their budget. And although I appreciate their willingness and, and pride with the fact that their entire budget is only up $369 over last year, which is, which is really keeping it tight. The question that we had in committee for them was, given the situation in, in Vermont with ag and, and some of the challenges out there, are we making, did we make the best investments uh, on, on, on where that goes? So I'm meeting with the secretary on Wednesday morning and to go over the budgets, and I will, I will bring up some of the questions here about investments in, in R&D. The second thing I, I just want to bring that I brought some extras. The uh, committee's been trying to work on, or my committee's been trying to work on a little more transparency, or actually everybody is, and how to communicate. I did bring with me a um, few, few copies because I had a welcome, welcome to your budget, your house appropriations budget overview, some data. Um, I had an event at the Bixby Library last Monday, which uh, Tim was a participant in, and I'm going to leave some copies of this for, for people who might be interested in it. Also a one-pager on the budget adjustment that actually, 
that did, that did pass and passed out of the Senate. And on the, the final word, which is fitting, because I wrote it down last night to actually remember to say this this morning, is that there's somebody missing here today that I'd love for us to have a moment of memory. Um, a constituent of mine who has always uh, attended the, the breakfast, and that's Paul Bovin, is not here this year. And I wanted to bring a hat of his uh, at the table. He's somebody that over my 10 years, I mean, I knew him before from our church community, but I got to know him much more as a constituent and some of the issues. And as everybody knows here, they're very strongly opinionated. <laughs> and, and, and has had a rather uh, vocal voice on a lot of issues, but his passing has impacted me, and I know that everybody here will miss him uh, greatly. So I just wanted to uh, bring that up, that he's not here, and that I think we'll all miss him. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. Amen to you and to Paul. Um, thank you all for coming out for this first legislative breakfast. We want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, there's a mayonnaise jar back there on that back table, and it's got a few dollars in it. We're hoping that a few more dollars get put in on your way out to help support these legislative breakfasts that are put on each week during the legislative session by the Bridgeport Grange and Addison County Farm Bureau. The second thing I wanted to say is please come out next Monday to the American Legion in Bristol. We should see you all there at 7 o'clock in the morning for breakfast and our program that begins at 7.30. American Legion in Bristol, next week, next Monday. Hope you can make it. In the meantime, legislators are here for you to ask questions, and we thank you for coming. Thank you.